scripture reading is taken from the book of Psalms, chapter 18, verses 30 and 30 through 32. And please read with me um, Psalms 18, 30, 32, please. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. For who is God except the Lord? And who is the rock except for our God? It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. This is God's word, and this is what I believe. Knowing you, which used to be called All I Once Held Dear, as we are going to be studying about Ruth today, I believe. Yes. Let's stand together as we sing Knowing You. All four verses.
I think he does a good job. He does a good job. I got a story for you guys. Um, I grew up in a Baptist church in uh, New Jersey. And when I was just a little guy, maybe your age, I used to stand on the pew to sing, right, next to my parents. And the radio theme song for my home church was 403 that we sang in the first part of the service, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Now, you know how the chorus goes. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Well, I didn't hear it that way. And so, standing up on the pew, singing at the top of my lungs, I sang, morning by morning, two birdies I see. <laughs> that was my version of great is thy faithfulness. Yeah. I was 23 before I got that straightened around. <laughs> two birdies I see. So... I'm glad to have you guys here singing with us this morning. And you guys, that was excellent. That was a song that we sang at Washington Bible College, wasn't it, Peg? Be Thou My Vision. Yeah, regularly. In his poem entitled The Present Crisis, James Russell Lowell spoke of the privilege and the importance, the necessity of making right choices. And he wrote this, Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil side. Something we all share in common is the privilege and the responsibility of making right choices. You remember Joshua put it this way to the people of Israel, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, there's a little something in there. I wasn't going to say it in the message, but I think I will. Uh, a little something in there you might miss. He, he says, are you going to serve the God of Israel or are you going to serve the gods of the Amorites? Oh, by the way, you're living in their land. They couldn't keep you out because they're powerless. You see that? In whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Well, as we continue our study of the book of Ruth, we meet several individuals who made significant life-determining choices. And so if you'll open your Bible to Ruth chapter 1, we're going to cover some verses we looked at last time, but we'll look at them a different way. First of all, we have the decision made by Elimelech, and that's in verses 1 to 3. Let me read it. And, and by the way, the issue here was his failure to take God seriously. Failure to take God seriously. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. You know, few people have greater need to seek the Lord's wisdom when making life choices than fathers. Fathers. Because so much is at stake. God has entrusted the welfare of a man's wife and his family to him. And his decisions will have a lasting impact on their lives. No pressure, though, dads. <laughs> Elimelech was a man who failed to take God seriously and as a result made a tragic decision. During a period of famine, Elimelech decided to move his family from the land that God had given to his people, move them from there to Moab. And this was no small decision. You see, the famine had been sent by God to discipline and to correct his people. Every famine, remember we mentioned last time, there's 13 of them in the Bible, every one of them was discipline, disciplinary. Instead of running from God's chastening, Elimelech should have humbled himself, examined his own heart, and led his family in repentance and renewed faith. But he tried to do something foolish. He tried to outrun God, and he failed. He failed. He tried to escape God's discipline by changing his address, only to discover that God followed him. Because, listen, nobody can outrun the Lord. Are you with me on that? Nobody can outrun God. 
If Elimelech would have humbled himself and repented of the sin in his own life and his family, the Lord would have met their needs. They lived in Bethlehem, which means house of bread. And somehow, the Lord whose name is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider, somehow this provider God would have provided for them in the midst of the famine. Listen to these words from the psalmist David. I've been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. David said, in all my days, all my days, I've never witnessed anybody who was right with God for whom God did not provide. Never seen that, he said. He'd never seen a true believer so destitute that he had, he and his family had to beg. You see, the fact is God takes care of his own. He takes care of his own kids. How many here have experienced God's faithfulness to meet their needs? Yeah. In remarkable ways, right? Unexpected ways. Because God has options open to him that we know nothing about. Nothing about. But in Elimelech's day, the spiritual condition of Israel was so low, few people knew the Lord or trusted his promises. Few in Israel claimed God as their king and provider. And the warning that the Lord had given through Moses had come to pass. Israel had fallen into the snare of forgetfulness. Deuteronomy 6, 10 to 15, So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build, houses full of good things which you did not fill, hewn out wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, when you have eaten and are full, then beware lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you, for the Lord your God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. But despite clear warnings like these, Israel had forgotten and forsaken God. They, they forgot that Jehovah is the living God. Instead, they were trusting pagan gods that are lifeless and powerless. And even though Elimelech's name meant my God is king, he didn't live up to the meaning of his name. When his stomach began to growl, he, he didn't turn to the Lord. Instead, he got out his road map and told his family to start packing their things. He abandoned the blessings of the promised land and moved across the Dead Sea into pagan territory. Now, you'll no doubt notice that throughout the narrative of Ruth, Naomi never protests her innocence, and she never protests her endorsement of her husband's decision. But I get the feeling, I get the distinct feeling that she was more godly than her husband. And uh, sadly, many marriages are just like hers was. If it was up to Naomi, her family might not have left Bethlehem. But once again, the decisions made by the one God has ordained as the head of the house often affect the whole family. And, and the consequences the family suffers are often the product of, uh, of a husband's lack of spiritual leadership. And so it is imperative that we who are husbands and fathers and grandfathers follow the leading of God and center our priorities around him. You see, the spiritual welfare of the family is our responsibility and our choices, our decisions matter. Matter. Some decisions invite blessing, and yet others can lead to trouble and serious consequences. And, and so to fail to take the lead in spiritual things is really the same as leading a family away from God. And because this decision to leave the promised land was a big deal, the consequences were severe. Uh, since the famine hadn't succeeded in turning Elimelech's heart around, uh, God's discipline took another form, and Elimelech was eliminated. His life ended prematurely. Naomi was left a grief-stricken widow, and her sons were fa left fatherless. And yet, despite this tragedy, the family stayed in Moab. Now, initially, it seems they intended to dwell in Moab, and the Hebrew word translated dwell typically implied a temporary residency. 
okay? But instead of a short-term stay, Moab soon became home to the family. What was temporary morphed into permanent. And as time passed, it became increasingly difficult to uproot and leave once they had settled in. And it was all because Elimelech, the family head, did not take God seriously. He didn't take the covenant he was under seriously. Well, secondly, we see the decisions of Malhan and Kilion in verses 3 to 5. And I've called this the ripple effect in poor choices. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, the name of the other Ruth, and they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Malan and Kilion also died. So the women survived her two sons and her husband. See, as the sons of Elimelech and Naomi grew into manhood, they quite naturally were attracted to the girls of Moab. But, I mean, who else was there for them? Uh, their, their environment offered no alternatives. And eventually, Malon and Kilion defied God's command, a command which they may have forgotten or were never taught, by marrying Moabite girls. And according to God's law, the Israelites were forbidden to take wives from the pagans around them, and especially not from the Moabites. In Deuteronomy 23.3, we find that a ban was prohibited, uh, uh, prohibited the Moabite people from attending any of Israel's religious gatherings. Why? Because of the way they treated Israel during Israel's time in the wilderness. They withheld aid. They fiercely opposed Israel. And in doing this, they became the enemies of God. So don't marry pagans, but especially Moabites. Cross-cultural marriages often bring some pretty serious challenges. And all sorts of differences exist between those of different ethnic and cultural backgrounds. And we can't know this with certainty, but Naomi may not have approved of the decisions of her sons in marriage. Instead, it seems she accepted the marriages and became a wonderful mother-in-law to her daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah. And she accepted them. She loved them. And her life and her faith made a strong impact on theirs. But while certain but not impossible challenges come with interracial or cross-cultural marriage, the New Testament commands only one difference to be entirely avoided. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? I can say this because we're far enough removed from it, but in our first church, we discovered, and didn't take long to discover it, that there had been a lot of disobedience to this command. There were a lot of Christian women who had married non-Christian husbands. And it weakened the family, and it weakened the structure of the church. It was a disobedience that was rooted in some serious history. In this regard, the New Testament is in total agreement with the Old Testament. There can be no spiritual fellowship in a marriage or a partnership where the respective parties worship different gods. See, it's sin for a believer to be yoked or connected in a legally binding relationship that God forbids. Having reached Marriageable age, Malan and Kilion were old enough to be responsible for their own decisions, but they chose to defy the command of the Lord. But their decisions were influenced by choices their father had made earlier. Elimelech's decision to move to Moab brought them into this pagan environment where the temptation to marry a Moabite girl was overwhelming. One bad decision led to others. And that's what I call the ripple effect of sinful choices. The same kind of disobedience happens today when a family refuses to follow the Lord 
refuses to be separate from the world, when the church isn't given its proper place in their lives, when believing parents surround themselves with unbelieving friends and business associates, you know, when the education, social life, and friendships of a family are found among unbelievers, listen, trouble is sure to follow. And nobody should be surprised when the young people in a family decide that marriage to an unbeliever is just not such a bad thing. These decisions are often rooted in earlier choices. So it would seem that the lack of faith in the rebellion of Elimelech had influenced his sons. You know, we say like father, like son, and it's true more times than not. Last Sunday, I, I mentioned a boy slumped in a church pew with his arms folded and a look of disinterest on his face week after week, you know. And, and the message of his body language was simply this. My dad thinks this is stupid, and so do I. So do I. I think he was only in church because of his mother's insistence. Apparently, the marriages of Malan and Kilion didn't last very long. Within 10 years of their father's death, the two sons of Elimelech also died. If the famine failed to produce repentance, the death of Elimelech didn't awaken them either. And so the Lord had to affect discipline on the family further by taking the lives of Malon and Kilion. I want you to know something. God's discipline is unrelenting. It's unrelenting. His determination to turn his children around sometimes outlasts his children. Now, before we move on, I want to clarify a couple of things. First of all, we need to remember that the family of Elimelech and Naomi were under God's covenant. They were redeemed people who had been graciously given an inheritance in the promised land. And as such, they were accountable to God's law. They pledged themselves to be accountable to God's law. And yet the Lord doesn't deal with everybody the same way. As somebody has said, the Lord does not spank the devil's kids. He only disciplines his own. And so Elimelech knew better and was responsible to do better because of who he was in covenant with the Lord. Now, unbelievers are not under God's covenant. They're not under God's discipline today. And this explains why sinners get away with so much. We have an escapee back there. That's really good. <laughs> I love it. We used to have an escapee from the nursery come up on the platform with me. Eddie Lip. And he'd get behind me, make all kinds of faces and whatnot, you know. Oh, Eddie's here again. Hi, Eddie. Yeah. Oh, that's sweet. Okay, where was I? Help! <laughs> so these marriages didn't last very long. And, and as I was saying, God's discipline is unrelenting. But here's where we were. Elimelech knew better, and he knew to do better. You know, there, there are natural consequences for sin that affect everybody. Everybody. You touch a hot stove, it's going to burn you, right? It's going to burn you. But the judgment of unbelievers is postponed until the great white throne judgment, the end of Revelation. God's final judgment and the discipline of his children today are different matters altogether. God does not discipline us to punish us. He does to correct us. God's not anxious to discipline his children. That's the second point. God, the Lord isn't up in heaven thinking, well, let's see, who can I zap today? <laughs> you know? Our Heavenly Father is patient and long-suffering. And, and I think all of us will admit um, his children receive far more patience and kindness and gentleness and love than discipline. But the Lord is persistent in his determination that our salvation be fully realized in a holy, sanctified life. Israel was redeemed to become his special, his peculiar people, a people that were holy and uniquely recognizable as people of God. And you know the same is true for us. That's God's will for your life as a Christian. We're called to be holy and distinct from those who don't know God. And God's purpose in discipline is to make us 
partakers of his holiness. For they verily, that's earthly fathers, for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he, the Lord, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. So God in love works steadily and patiently to move us closer to this objective. But if we stubbornly resist, if our decisions are made outside of his will, the Lord can pour on some pressure we didn't see coming. His love can be very tough. And ultimately, we know he holds our lives in his hands. And like the potter who can't make something good out of the clay that he's working with, he he may discard it. He may discard it. Even in the extreme case when God takes one of his children home prematurely, their salvation isn't lost. Lost is the opportunity to live a life of faith on earth. Lost is the opportunity to love the Lord by faith. Lost is the privilege of serving the Lord and receiving reward that comes with that choice. But one final word. We must never think that every sickness, every setback, every death is the result of God's discipline. We we jump to that conclusion far too often. There are other purposes for the adverse things that happen in the lives of God's children. But every adversity that comes should prompt us to examine our hearts. To examine our hearts. If we are honest before the Lord, we'll know whether the trouble is God-sent discipline or not. And you know what peace is in the life of a believer? Peace is knowing it is well with my soul despite my troubles. It's well with my soul. And so the story of Ruth opens with a sad story of a prodigal family who made poor choices and and suffered the consequences, very consequential consequences. God had dealt harshly with Elimelech and his family because they refused to humble themselves under the discipline of the famine. But you know, from this point onward, the story takes a very pleasant turn. Aren't you happy for that? Say, I'm very happy about that. I'm tired of hearing about kids dying and husbands dying. Yeah, this makes me very happy. The decision of Naomi, verse 6 and 7. And here we find the definition of repentance. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Now, repentance always involves something. It always involves turning from something to something. You got it? It's turning from something to something. You see that here. And at last, our prodigal family has made a right decision. Finally, the message has gotten through. And in verse 6, we find one of the key words in Ruth. It's the word return, return. What Naomi realized she must do was make a 180-degree turn from the choice, the direction her family had taken some years earlier. She needed to return to go back to Bethlehem. And so much loss and heartache could have been avoided if only the family had stayed there. Naomi heard the news that the famine in Israel was over. Things were were looking up in the promised land. Now, listen carefully. Those who believe that God is sovereignly in control of everything, don't read the news the way people read it who think the world runs by blind chance. In her heart, Naomi interpreted the news to mean that the Lord had again visited his people in grace and mercy. The Lord had forgiven them, had supplied them with the food they needed. The famine had ended because God had lifted it. God had lifted it. So question, how do you read the local and the world news? Do you see God in the headlines? Can you see his will performed in human events? Remember the psalmist said, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. 
Despite the chaos, God still controls his creation. Amen? You know, I could be wrong, but I don't think Naomi returned to Bethlehem because of the renewed food supply. There's plenty of food in Moab. The end of the famine and the renewed visitation of God signaled something. The report reminded her that the Lord stands ready and willing to forgive and to restore his people when they turn to him. When they turn to him. And you know, this promise is found everywhere in the Bible. The way back to the Lord isn't a long journey, it's just a turn. It's just a turn. A promise that Naomi may have remembered uh, is contained in Deuteronomy 4, 29 to 31. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. When you're in distress and all these things come upon you in the latter days, when you turn to the Lord your God and obey his voice, for the Lord your God is a merciful God, he will not forsake you nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers which he swore to them. God doesn't wash his hands of us, even though at times we fail. The blessing of renewal and restoration is for any sinner who will repent of sin and return to the Lord. Now, repentance is a choice, very important choice. It's a decision that can be made by anyone who will honestly admit their failures, honestly admit their sin. And, and you know the New Testament story of, of the prodigal son illustrates this in a most wonderful and beautiful way. When the prodigal came to his senses and returned to his father's home, what did he find? He find, found his, his father was waiting there to greet him with open arms. And a father put a robe on him and a ring on his finger. And, and the father prepared a great banquet. And, and this was all rejoicing because the prodigal had come home. I mean, he behaved like a scoundrel, but his father was there to meet him. Well, in Israel, the rains had returned because God sent them. The famine was over because God had visited his people in mercy and grace. And having been through the desert of disappointment, Naomi now thirsted for God and the refreshment that he would rain down on her if she returned to him. And you know, her experience reminds us of Psalm 42. As the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night while they continually say to me, where is your God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with a voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. You know, it had been, it had been decades, decades since Naomi worshipped the Lord at his temple. And and though she hadn't forgotten the songs of Zion, the last time she sang them with God's people was decades ago. But Naomi had come to a critical place in her spiritual life. She came to a point of conviction and decision and a change of direction. She would either respond to God or she would tune him out. She heard the still, small voice of God. Have you heard his voice lately? Have you responded to the promptings of his word and his spirit? There was nothing easy about Naomi's decision to leave Moab. The household she established there had to be broken up. Her possessions had to be reduced to what little she could carry. She had to give up some friendship she'd made. She had, to come, she had come to Moab full, but she returned home empty, verse 21 says. And as the crow flies, the distance from Moab to Bethlehem was about 50 miles, and Spirit Airline wasn't working yet. But over the rugged and mountainous terrain, the distance could have been 75 miles. This was an arduous and dangerous journey for a woman her age. And, and then there was the 
the social problem. I see a woman without a husband was often a social outcast. Who, who would support her? How would her needs be met? How would she deal with the pain of loneliness? And as we read on, it seems clear that she fully expected her daughters-in-law to stay behind in Moab. And so at this point, humanly speaking, her future must have seemed terribly bleak. Oh, but God was working in her heart. And did you hear that phrase, but God, but God? You want to trace that through the Bible. It's, it's just an awesome phrase. God is the unseen factor who makes all the difference, but God. You know, as Paul wrote to the believers at Ephesus, he is able, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. That's superlative heaped upon superlative. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. See, it was God who was left out of Elimelech's decision to move to Moab. And God was disobeyed by her son's marriages. But, but God still was present, and God still was willing to forgive and restore Naomi if she returned to him. At this moment, Naomi faced a crossroads, and she knew what she ought to do, but knew it would cost a great deal. Listen, it costs a great deal to follow the Lord Jesus. You agree with me? It costs a great deal to follow him. It costs our entire life to follow him. But this was the journey she must make. Her heart couldn't be genuinely converted apart from going home. She would have to trust God to protect and to provide for her needs. Naomi's portrait is that of a soul in conflict. And, and I've been there, and, and perhaps you have too. Life for her had become a tragic disappointment. The road behind was marked with failure and graves, and the way ahead looked equally perilous. Her dreams had, had turned uh, to, to nightmares, and her reality was reduced to only one constant changeless element, and that is God. Everything boiled down to this irreducible fact, God. God was still there. He was still reaching out to her. His offer still held if Naomi would seek him. But if Naomi would return to the Lord, there was hope. And the deep longing and conviction of her heart demanded action that cost her everything. She'd have to turn her back on Moab, admit that it was sin for her family to move there, and return to Bethlehem brokenhearted and empty-handed. See what's happened here? The fog, the fog of uncertainty has burned off, and life's issues were now brought into the light. And either God would be trusted and his will obeyed, or more trouble would be ahead. Wrong decisions had led her to this godless place, and only right decisions could lead her home. And so this was Naomi's moment of truth. You know, in the Christian life, there are moments like these, and perhaps there are more than we realize. You know, God created us free moral agents, having the power to choose and decide for ourselves. And yet our lives are woven together by the choices we make. Some, some decisions are small, but almost none of them are insignificant. Mickey tells of a decision that he made in his life, and it meant parting company with someone who had been a close friend. Are you sorry you made that decision, Mickey? Happy, absolutely. Hard to walk away from a close friend. But when he's going the wrong way, don't go, go that way with him. Eventually, these tiny choices influence and factor into larger choices. And yet the one constant is this. Our decisions are never without consequences. Our choices either draw us closer to God and his righteousness, or they lead us away. And I want to tell you, going God's way leads to blessing. Yet the one constant is this. Our decisions are never without consequences. Our choices will draw us closer or move us farther away. Now, Naomi was blessed to have this opportunity to repent and let God turn her life around. 
For Elimelech, Malon, and Kilion, the opportunity to choose the Lord's way had passed. See, their moment of truth, their opportunity to be restored to fellowship with God had passed with their final breath. It was too late for them. Too late for them to be restored to fellowship with God. And yet, it isn't too late for any of us who have a pulse, right? If you have a pulse, give it a, give it a little check there, will you? Yeah, I got a watch that can do that now. Hey, you're still here. You're still breathing. You're still kicking, right? It's not too late for you. It's not too late for you. But once again, each of us have the privilege to choose and decide. We're not under any constraint. To the unbeliever, the Lord Jesus says, come to me. Believe in me. Trust me to save you. Trust me to lead you into a better life, a life that is abundant and full. And to the Christian who is away from the place of God's fellowship and blessing, the Lord says, come home. (laughs) Come home. Return to me. And I will forgive you and I will restore you. And even to those who are following the Lord, the voice of God pleads this way. Come closer. Come closer. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. No matter what our spiritual condition is, it will cost us something to make the Lord our choice. It's not an easy road that God asks us to walk, but it is by far the best road. It is the road that leads to fulfillment, blessing, and life everlasting. Now, stay tuned. All right? There are more chapters to Ruth. And we're going to see that Naomi found more than she ever dreamed possible when she chose to obey the Lord and to serve him above every other consideration. And so will we. But let me quickly draw your attention to three takeaways. First of all, choose to take God seriously. Choose to take God seriously. Obedience to his word leads to happiness and life, but disobedience leads to misery and death. Secondly, remember, there's a ripple effect to our choices. Others are affected by the choices that we make. They're watching, they're observing, they're listening. Repentance, thirdly, isn't a long journey. It's just a turn from our way to God's way. And you know, we don't make that decision one time. We make that decision every day to turn God's way instead of our own. Let's bow our heads and hearts in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and its truthfulness. We thank you, Lord, that you are a merciful God, a God who forgives, a God who restores, a God who loves us so much that he will discipline us when we're getting off the rails. And, And so, Father, I just pray that you take your word and apply it to each heart, each life that's here today. And you know the condition of our hearts. You know the decision that we need to make and continue to make. And we know that by your spirit, you have help for those who are willing to make that right choice. So help us all, we pray. Thank you again for your great love. Thank you again for your salvation plan by which we are made right with you. For we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.